Kia ora kosha and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, if you haven't heard of us before, we're a public policy think tank based at AUT University in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. Um, it's great to be here today uh, with, together with the New Zealand Initiative to host John Hudak, a Deputy Director of the Centre for Effective Public Management at the Brookings Institution. Uh, so firstly, welcome John and thank you so much for your time. Uh, Brookings, for those of you who, who may not have worked with them before, is one of the oldest think tanks in the United States and is highly regarded for its nonpartisan public policy research. Uh, John is also the author of a recently re-released book called Marijuana, A Short History, which charts the history of how cannabis emerged from the shadows of counterculture in the United States and emerged instead to become a serious public policy issue and a source of legal revenue for both business and government. Uh, in his book, he discusses why that change has occurred and what those changes mean for the future place of cannabis in society. We're holding this webinar at this time because, of course, New Zealand is about to have a unique opportunity to change the way we regulate personal cannabis use. Uh, on the ballot at this year's general election, there will be a question asking, do you support the Cannabis Legalisation and Control Bill? If we vote no, uh, the chance for change might pass for a generation. Uh, so in, in the spirit of informing the debate about this referendum, uh, together with the New Zealand Initiative, uh, we are hosting John to learn about what has happened in the United States as they have ventured into the area of cannabis legalization uh, and what we could learn from it. Um, I should say that our organization, the Helen Clark Foundation, has actually taken a position which is unusual for us. We don't have a formal position like this on any other issue, but we decided it would be disingenuous to pretend we hadn't come to an opinion uh, about what we would like to see happen uh, off the basis of a, um, some research we did last year. And we ended up calling that research report the case for yes in 2020 because we thought the case for change was ultimately very strong. Um, but to be clear, um, New Zealand Initiative doesn't share that position, but they share our commitment to evidence-informed, robust debate in the lead up to the referendum. And so that's why we're here together hosting John to learn about what's happened in the United States and what we can learn here in New Zealand. Um, early voting op opens this Saturday, uh, so uh, please do check your enrolled. Uh, we'll be putting some links in the chat about that. Um, so yeah, please do vote, even if you don't agree with us. Um, before I hand over to the New Zealand Initiative's Chief Economist, Eric Crampton, to set the scene for today's webinar, uh, I'd just like to cover off a few Zoom housekeeping matters. Uh, as I know, uh, looking at the registration list, uh, some of you haven't joined us before for a webinar. Um, apologies if you have, you will know this all already. Um, but firstly, uh, we cannot see or hear you. Uh, so this isn't a normal Zoom call. Uh, don't worry if you need to take a call or leave the room or move papers around, you're not going to cut us off. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that we don't want to hear from you. Uh, so if you'd like me to ask John a particular question, please pop that in the Q&A. Um, and uh, also please open Q&A even if you don't have a question because you can vote on other people's questions and the ones that get the most votes will move to the top of the list and I'll be more likely to ask them. Uh, you'll also see along the bottom of your screen um, you'll see that Q&A function and you'll also see something, the chat function. Um, that is where you can put any technical questions you might have. In my, for example, if you can't see me or you can't hear me, uh, please put that in the chat and Paul will do his best to help you. Uh, Paul's running the back end uh, of this today. Uh, also, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the other attendees, uh, say where you're joining from, feel free to pop that in the chat as well. Uh, I know most of you are actually watching this on Facebook, um, so if you are on the Facebook stream, uh, you can put questions um, below the stream and um, Sarah uh, will be moving those over into Zoom to make sure I see them. Um, so please feel free to ask questions there. Um, so just, just to recap that, um, if you're watching on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A function for things that you'd like to see me ask John. If you're on Facebook, please pop them below uh, the stream. Um, we do have someone watching that. Um, so the format for today's event, just before I hand over to Eric, uh, is that I'll ask I'll start off by asking John some scripted questions just to warm things up. Uh, and then in the second half, I'll move to taking the questions that come in from you. Uh, so please, every time you think of something, just pop it in the Q&A and vote on any questions that you'd like to see asked. 
so that's enough from me for now. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Eric Crampton, the Chief Economist of the New Zealand Initiative, who will set the scene for today's event. Thanks so much, Kathy. I was really excited when Kathy got in touch about a month ago suggesting this event. If we step back about a year when we were seeing the referendum coming and a bit of ambiguity about what might be in or out of the legislation because it was still being drafted, we were expecting that there was just huge potential for misinformation coming through uh, a referendum campaign during an election campaign. We expected that there'd be a fair bit of scaremongering about what might be allowed under the legislation and about the experience abroad. So it's really great to have an expert in on just what has happened in the United States. A few months ago, the initiative, we're a Wellington-based think tank, we're supported by a business membership community. We don't have a position on the legislation, but we do want uh, people to be well informed about what actually has happened in the United States what the features are of New Zealand's legislation and what the likely outcomes then might be. I personally have a position on it and get into that a little bit later, but uh, for now it makes sense to just know what the features of the legislation are and what has happened elsewhere so people can draw their own conclusions. So we were worried about this kind of thing, so we put up a bit of a website that just details the experience in each of the 50 states in the United States, just what the features of the legislation are, whether they maintain prohibition, whether they've shifted to legalization, so if advocates on one side or the other started making wild claims about what's happened in Montana or Colorado or anywhere, you could just click on the state and see what's happened. And I think we've got a link to that in the website. For better details on New Zealand's legislation, I'd strongly recommend looking at the referendum website, looking at the materials that have been put up by the New Zealand Drug Foundation, and there are a few others out there, just going through the features of the legislation, and I'll note a few of them here, to give some context to the American experience, because 50 states give you 50 different laboratories for experimenting with policy and seeing what might work and seeing what doesn't, and they all kind of update while they're watching each other's experience and their own to find out what works, what might not, and some of the drafting of New Zealand's legislation is in the context of that experimentation in the United States, so that we've learned from them about what might work and what might not. They've come to legislation that is, I think, towards the more conservative end of what's been experienced in the United States. It's fairly restrictive. We can go through some of those restrictions. There are obviously restrictions on age, so if you're under 20, you're not going to be able to have access to it. Um, there are restrictions on possession. You can't buy too much of it. You can't have, um, you can't buy more than 14 grams. Um, there are restrictions on where you can consume it. So you can consume it in your private home or maybe in a friend's house. You can't consume it in public. You can consume it in a licensed uh, consumption facility. There are strict licensing provisions around who can be allowed to sell it, who can be allowed to have a consumption facility. Oddly, we've got a bit of a restriction where if you've got a license to grow, you're not going to be allowed to be a retailer or a consumption facility. That might mean that we'd have some fewer of the tourism benefits that you might have seen in places like Colorado. Uh, if people like going to consume in a place where they get to meet the grower. All of this means that we've got a fairly restrictive set of legislation and that if you're worried about some of the experiences that might have happened in more liberal states in the United States, well, a lot of that's already been ruled out by advertising bans here, by restrictions on who would be allowed to operate and who wouldn't be. But enough from me, we'll throw it over to John to explain exactly what's happened in the United States, what the different features of their legislation are, and I'll be excited to hear about it as well. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, so uh, John's other hat, I should say, is, is an expert in American presidential politics, which is obviously a pretty um, busy job at the moment. Um, so in light of that, I thought I would open things by asking, could you set the scene for us about where does cannabis policy sit in the USA at the moment going into the presidential? election? What do the candidates think? Has momentum for reform built up or has it stalled? Uh, so uh, momentum in the United States has certainly uh, built up significantly and, and Kathy, thank you. I want to thank you for the invitation, the Helen Clark Foundation as well and Eric for joining in. Um, this is a great opportunity to share from uh, quite a distance away as I think a lot of you uh, can imagine. I would much rather be in New Zealand than in the United States right now. Um, but alas, uh, speaking to you from a day away and many thousand miles is really my honor and privilege. Uh, but to your question, uh, the, uh, there has been enormous momentum, particularly over the past 10 years, around cannabis legalization in the U.S., both at the state and at the federal level. 
Um, that is not slowing down. We're seeing more states uh, voting on cannabis legalization in the November elections this year, including New Jersey, um, which just uh, uh, was declared official that they would be voting on uh, that ballot initiative, uh, as well as uh, other states like Arizona, Mississippi is voting on a medical initiative uh, as well. Uh, that's happening because there have been dramatic changes in public policy in the United States. Uh, when you look back to uh, you know, the year 2008, so 12 years ago, uh, you're looking at support for legalization in the United States under 50% nationwide. It's now about 68% nationwide. And at the state level, those changes uh, in some places are even much more dramatic than that over shorter periods of time. Uh, and so there's a reflexiveness in policy uh, because of that. We're also seeing a lot of elected officials no longer scared to talk about cannabis reform. Uh, drug policy in the United States was always something that united the uh, two parties behind a strong law and order approach. Uh, and as conversations around cannabis reform popped up, you saw politicians running for the exits because that was always something that was toxic. That was always something that would uh, ensure that people would lose uh, their seat in the next election. But uh, now you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing candidates embrace cannabis legalization in the United States in a lot of parts of the United States because it's exactly the opposite. It's a political winner. It is attracting voters to you. Um, and it's no longer that liability. And I expect, uh, given that the experiments in the states uh, have not really gone awry and uh, it, it, at a minimum, uh, and, and we see voters reflecting that, they're not uh, seeing new ballot initiatives and saying, oh God, no, we can't do that because look what happened in Colorado or look what happened in California. Voters continue to embrace it. And so it makes me believe that voters will continue to embrace it in higher numbers. Yeah, that's, that's really encouraging to hear. Our polls certainly are looking um, pretty tight on, on this issue. Um, I was interested to ask a bit about who are the groups that actively lobby in favour of prohibition in the United States? Um, one in particular called Smart Approaches to Marijuana has recently created a New Zealand branch for the duration of the referendum. Uh, most of us have never heard of them before. They've appeared very recently uh, and appear to be very well funded. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about who they are and where they came from. Uh, sure, Project SAM is a, a robust organization in the United States. I would say it is uh, hands down the largest, most organized uh, group that focuses on uh, defeating cannabis reform initiatives uh, at the state level, nationally, at municipal levels, and, and also, uh, as you said, at times abroad. Uh, it's run by an individual named Kevin Sabet. Um, who operates out of the University of Florida. Uh, he had a, a fairly long career across multiple administrations working in our Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is an office that sits within the White House. Um, he's uh, very well versed on, on drug policy. He's been uh, doing this work for quite some time. Uh, they do have obviously a fundraising and a political activity arm uh, to it. That's a significant part of what they do. They engage in uh, the legislative battles, they engage it, at times in the ballot initiatives, and uh, they really are, I would say, the core of opposition uh, on this issue uh, in the United States. Now, there are other groups, uh, leadership in law enforcement agencies like police chiefs, organizations, um, groups like that. Uh, there are some, there are some uh, organized concerned parents groups uh, and, and other groups that pop up sometimes, state medical associations, uh, particularly on medical, ba uh, medical cannabis legalization ballot initiatives, uh, and other groups here and there. But really, in the United States, uh, Project SAM is the core. And stepping back a bit, could you set the scene for how and when the United States first prohibited cannabis? Because it hasn't always been illegal, has it? Uh, yeah, it has not always been illegal. It's a uh, a bit of a storied history, like most things are, most uh, hot button issues are in most countries. Uh, in the United States, medical cannabis was something that was uh, fairly common, or, or certainly not unheard of, in, first in colonial America, uh, definitely in uh, the United States when it was young, and, and throughout, most of, uh, throughout really all of the 1800s and into the 1900s. But starting in the 1900s, the drug policy conversation in the US uh, started to change dramatically. This happened uh, for a few reasons. First, 
um, there was a real racial strife happening in the United States around issues, uh, particularly of immigration, but um, certainly uh, other issues around race in our country with freed slaves and a failed reconstruction effort. Uh, and uh, what ultimately happened was the size and scope of the United States central government grew, uh, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and that began to absorb uh, and regulate many more areas of public policy. And in the early part of, of the 20th century, drugs and cosmetics fell into that, uh, over, into that purview of the federal government. They've held on to that ever since. Uh, and in the process, it has really used uh, drug policy broadly and cannabis policy specifically as a divisive political tool. Um, against outgroups, whether they were uh, Mexican immigrants, African Americans, uh, beatniks, hippies, uh, whoever, um, there were always outgroups to vilify with, with drug policy. Now, the effective uh, barring uh, or making cannabis illegal in the United States uh, happened in 1937. Uh, Congress passed what's called uh, the Cannabis, uh, the Marijuana Tax Act, rather, um, which said that medical cannabis could be sold, but doctors needed to get a stamp uh, from the Treasury to be able to be certified to do it. So there was a system in place. The problem was the Treasury Department refused to issue any stamps. Um, so effectively, cannabis was illegal, um, although not formally. That formal uh, change would happen in 1970 when Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act which was the United States um, federal government legislation that brought the nation in compliance uh, with the single convention on narcotic drugs from the 1960s. Thank you for that. And could you tell us a bit about how, what is the so-called war on drugs uh, and how did that come about? Uh, so I touched a little bit about this. The war on drugs is really the federal government's um, use of drug policy um, to, uh, propagate certain ends. And, and some of those ends are admirable, right? The massive importing of illegal substances into the United States, not just cannabis, um, but other products as well. Cocaine, um, methamphetamines, most recently uh, things like fentanyl, um, and, uh, uh, but other drugs like heroin over time uh, have certainly fallen under that. And so the desire to control those types of substances coming into the United States, and of course they're uh, spread dis their distribution and sale within the United States is in the government's interest. Um, at the same time, the war on drugs has been probably the least effective war in American history. Um, it's cost trillions of dollars, um, and over time, it has not created the types of policy outcomes that were promised by uh, presidents of both parties and congresses of both parties. Uh, and so, uh, what has ultimately happened in parallel with trying to achieve policy goals. Um, you know, lower levels of uh, addiction, lower levels of use generally, certainly um, uh, issues around youth use, uh, driving hazards, et cetera. A lot of the issues that are being discussed right now in New Zealand um, with, with their initiative, um, those, in addition to trying to achieve goals in those areas, um, there was also a more sinister political aspect to the war on drugs. And many times that was holding down uh, people of color disproportionately using the tools of law enforcement against communities of color. Um, so black and brown Americans in the United States are four times more likely on average to be arrested for a cannabis related offense uh, than a white American is. Um, despite use, uh, use rates between uh, white and black America being about the same. Uh, and that leads to uh, on order of six, seven, 800,000 arrests for marijuana related offenses in the US every year. Um, disproportionately felt in communities of color. That war on drugs is not a benevolent one. That war on drugs is not even one with good intent behind it. That war on drugs is just systemic racism in the United States uh, being perpetuated and manifesting in a government controlled uh, uh, policy effort. Uh, turning to the legalization and the increasing uh, turn towards legalization as a tool. I understand Colorado was the first state to legalize. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how, why Colorado? Uh, and was, as, as a cause, was it championed by the Democratic Party? Was it a progressive cause? Was it bipartisan? Could you just tell us a bit about what happened? Uh, sure, so um, it, for a little bit of history, Colorado was our first state to come online with a commercial uh, cannabis system. 
uh, in the United States. Colorado and Washington State both legalized on the same day, election day in 2012. Uh, Washington's system was a bit slower to roll out than Colorado's was. Colorado started sales January 1st of 2014, uh, and Washington started in July of 2014, about six months later. Um, but uh, yeah, they were the first two states uh, to uh, take this approach uh, by ballot initiative successfully. Uh, and uh, their sort of route to success was very similar. For a little bit of background, um, they passed by almost exactly the same percentage of the vote, right around 55% of the vote, give or take a couple of percentage points, both states were the same. Uh, in terms of uh, how that was, oh, why those states? Uh, the American West has always had an independent streak in it, um, uh, drawn largely from settlement from East to West and the types of people who were willing to endure the risks of expansion, frontier expansion, um, created real uh, noticeable, documentable political ideologies within those states. And so um, there is a very independent streak, still independent of party in a lot of these states. Uh, there's a very strong uh, set of libertarian values. I would say um, many more people calling themselves libertarians than actually are libertarians, but nonetheless having libertarian values woven into their political ideologies. And so what you were able to do in, the, in both of these states, especially Colorado, but Washington too, was to bring together liberals who are generally very supportive of uh, cannabis reform with libertarians, um, who there are larger numbers in a place like Colorado than there are, say, uh, in a place like Connecticut or, or New York. And so um, that was able to create the bases uh, for uh, a ballot initiative to possibly be successful. Um, but of course, that is not a critical mass in either of those states, just liberals and libertarians. Uh, and so now I should also note there's a lot of liberals in both Colorado and Washington as well. And, and so um, when uh, the uh, initiative campaigns began, the goal was to start to recruit more people to the cause and really identifying which groups would be uh, least likely to support it. So in the United States, um, the least likely to support cannabis reform tend to be white uh, conservative Republican uh, individuals who are uh, particularly values voters or, or faith-based voters. Evangelical Christians in the United States have very low levels of support, especially relative to other religions. Um, so religious conservatives in the United States are really the, the tough group. Um, and there are a lot of them in Colorado, uh, but reaching out to other groups like law enforcement, um, uh, like the medical community, uh, like uh, what we call here soccer moms, uh, some uh, moms who uh, don't work or work part time and generally raise their kids, um, but particularly women with children within you know, that 25 to 50 age range. I'm um, trying to convince them maybe not to vote um, for cannabis reform, but not to be so vehemently closed minded as to um, just assume it is something that will har harm their children but to think about it in a more critical way. Uh, and that was able to cobble together a significant coalition, uh, which I think surprised a lot of people. It certainly surprised me. Um, the polling had it right around dead even um, in the days before election day. And then ultimately, as I said, 55% of the voters in each state voted in favor. Um, so where is public opinion tracking now in those states? Is it remaining largely supportive of legalization or are there some states which are considering going back to prohibition? So states are not considering going back to prohibition. I mean, there are certainly very small movements or online groups that, that continue to question it in, in several states. Um, but public opinion has held steady around the margins at which states approved ballot initiatives, and in some cases with higher margins. So Colorado supports around 61, 62%, um, which given you know, age uh, uh, trajectories and demographic changes, that's probably about the same if they had rerun the ballot, if that ballot initiative were held today, um, all else being equal. And so, yeah, that, that number has stayed pretty stable. And I think it reflects um, that while, yes, there are problems that exist in, in some states um, uh, that are uh, related to uh, regulatory issues um, or uh, public policy outcomes that were not necessarily forethought for originally, um, 
the voters don't think those things are bad enough to reverse this policy. They think they're manageable um, or they think they are being managed. Okay, so I'm just going to ask my final scripted question now. So for those of you who uh, want to see me put particular questions to John, please do drop those in the Q&A function. Um, so just to, to finish up, I was going to ask you, so of course, cannabis remains illegal at the federal level at the moment in the United States. And what do you think the prospects are for change there? And how important do you think it is? Uh, so at the federal level, um, you know, change is coming. Uh, we've seen dramatic changes in our Congress already. Um, in November, um, I'm sorry, in September of last year, almost, almost to the day, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives passed uh, what's called the Safe Banking Act, which would extend uh, financial services, uh, institutional financial services to the cannabis industry in states that have opted to legalize for medical or adult use or both. Uh, and that was the first standalone pro-cannabis reform piece of legislation that any chamber of the United States Congress ever passed. Um, we've also seen uh, committees uh, vote to approve uh, more uh, substantive, more significant legislation, more comprehensive legislation like the MORE Act, which was approved by the Judiciary Committee um, earlier in the year and uh, is likely to come up for a vote uh, in the full house later in the year. So these changes are happening in part because of significant lobbying efforts, in part because states are changing and the members who represent those states, both in our house and in our Senate, um, are also changing along with that. Not all of them, but many of them do. Uh, and there's just fresh blood in the Congress. And I think, you know, one of the uh, truisms in the United States, and, and it's also true um, internationally as well, is that young people, young voters tend to support uh, cannabis reform at much higher rates than older voters. And as those younger voters, um, people you know, under the age of 40 are starting to get into Congress and they're replacing people who were in their 60s or 70s or 80s, um, those changes can actually be fairly significant. And now that we're seeing um, for the past few Congresses, millennials uh, representing um, house districts, uh, it is, it's something that that changes uh, sort of a freight train. Uh, it's moving and it's inevitable because of, uh, you know, life and death and, and, uh, and how things work and generational replacement. Uh, but it's also happening because people are also changing their minds within Congress. They're not just coming to Congress pro-reform. There are anti-reform people who are becoming pro-reform people as well. And so that's a, a timely kind of comment to end on with the, the at the moment, what is the, the most popular question that has been asked um, from Catherine. Uh, she wanted me to ask you, what is the experience in the US with younger people's use following legalization? Uh, have you seen higher rates of youth use? Have you seen the same or lower? I just, um, you broke up a little, Kathy. You said youth use or, or youth, youth use. Yes, that's right. So younger people, are, are they using at higher rates, the same sure. or lower? Sure. Um, so this is a, a complex question, uh, and, but it's an important one because it's one that I think we, we all think about. Uh, reform advocates do not want to see 10-year-olds using cannabis. I think that's a myth that's out there, that there's this idea that, you know, people are just going to be running down the halls of primary schools, throwing joints in, into classroom doors. That's, that's not what anyone wants. Um, and so, it's a, as I said, it's a really important question and thank you for asking it. What we found in the United States um, is generally that cannabis legalization so far has not led to spikes in youth use. Um, generally, in the states that have legalized, you're seeing uh, flat levels uh, of use uh, for younger uh, individuals. Um, or in some cases, you're seeing decreases uh, in that use. Uh, now, it's important to note that this is very early on in the American experience, right? We have uh, Colorado and Washington, as I said earlier, were the first states uh, to come online in 2014. Uh, for the most part, we don't have data um, for a lot of the things we're asking questions about, certainly for 2020, um, in most cases for 2019, in some cases even for 2018, as uh, some federal agencies and state agencies take a lot of time to um, put those data out. Uh, and so we're, we're still looking at slivers of time. Uh, and so I think anyone who tells you that the, um, that the verdict is in, that there's clear, systematic, comprehensive, scientific evidence that points in one direction, uh, they're lying to you, uh, to be frank. 
uh, we don't have that solid answer. We have some indications um, that by and large, it doesn't have a, a, a significant impact on youth use. Um, but that said, it doesn't mean we won't in the future. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon a state and local governments to stay engaged to make sure that those numbers um, stay down. It's also important to make sure that when we're talking about youth use, um, we're putting that data into the right context. Simply pointing to one data point, one change over the course of one year um, is not a scientifically valid claim of conclusive evidence. Uh, and that happens a lot. And that happens a lot from both sides of this issue. Uh, and so uh, what I would say is that it's encouraging to see um, the numbers as they are um, in the United States. Uh, it is important too to note that in some of those age groups, particularly the 18 to 22 demographic in some states, we are seeing increases um, in use. And so thinking about the ways that a regulatory system, a public health education system uh, can help uh, work on those issues uh, is, an, is an important part of it. Um, but it, I think certainly from the American experience, it's hard to say that this is an experiment not worth um, moving towards uh, because of those data. Uh, it ties in well to another question that's come in from a viewer, Paul, uh, asking which US state has the most similar cannabis control regime to the one that is being proposed in New Zealand and what have the outcomes been there? I think well, once you answer, John, I will also kick over to Eric for this one because I know the New Zealand Initiative's website has, um, has looked into some of that. But, but firstly, what do you think of that? I know you're not as familiar with our legislation perhaps as um, other people, but you are broadly familiar with the outline of what's proposed here. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think Eric is right uh, when he said at the outset that this is a more conservative, a more restrictive uh, system than what we see in the United States. Um, to, to see a system that, you know, controls THC levels, that has outright bans on it, um, advertising, um, you know, th those are things that we're not exactly seeing in the United States. And so I think it's hard to uh, balance uh, or rather, it's hard to compare uh, what, what you're doing with what other states uh, have done. And so what I will say, though, is there are certainly elements of uh, the law that you can see in a lot of states. And they center around um, issues around age. So uh, your age of use is going to be 20. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, that threshold is 21. Um, and, and so, you know, th those are similar, I think, culturally similar uh, concepts. Uh, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, a licensing scheme for businesses, uh, you know, most states in the U.S. use that model. There are some models where, um, you know, you only have home grows um, of plants, like in Vermont. Uh, but generally, those are, are pretty similar to what a lot of states are doing. But, but you guys are taking that extra step um, to try to rein in what I would say in some cases are probably mistakes that have been made. Uh, in the American model and in other cases because of um, a greater focus on, uh, a greater more serious focus um, on issues around public health uh, and public safety. And, and so, yeah, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, I'd love to hear what Eric says. Um, it's hard to pick out one state and say that it's quite similar, but there's certainly similar threads throughout. No, I'd agree with uh, you. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, no, I'd agree with John. It's going to be tough to pick any single state. There's too many differences across each of them. And the American, er, American states, as I've seen them, have often modeled cannabis legislation on their existing alcohol rules, especially when you start thinking about uh, advertising. And then when they start encountering uh, things that they haven't liked around it, like maybe a billboard that goes up advertising cannabis, then they'll rethink how that uh, approach might get handled. Uh, New Zealand has not gone that way and has started from a far more restrictive uh, position. On the plus side, that means that a lot of the things that scaremongering types would worry about are already forbidden by the legislation. On, perhaps on the downside, it's meant that the process for getting that legislation has taken a while. And if we had started with the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, crossed out the word, word alcohol, written in cannabis wherever it appears, and then tweaked from there, we might have had legislation that could have been passed by parliament, ready to be authorized by a referendum instead of legislation that will have to be litigated after the referendum when it's introduced to parliament. So there's trade-offs either way there. 
One interesting bit that I'd noted in John's book was around some of the equity implications of legalization and how communities that have been harmed by prohibition in some cases get shut out of legalized markets. And it's interesting to see in contrast in New Zealand's legislation, some of those equity considerations are front and center when considering who would be allowed to be licensed as a retail outlet. So they're trying to award licenses disproportionately or upweight applications from communities that have been disproportionately harmed by prohibition. So again, it's sort of looking at some of the US experience and then updating in the approach here uh, on how to handle it. So that's been kind of neat. And if John had anything to say on that side of it, on um, baking some of those equity uh, considerations into the licensing regime at the outset, I'd be interested. Yeah, I think um, it's important to think about equity in terms of licensing, that is to make sure that the communities that have been hurt most by the war on drugs and by cannabis prohibition um, are given um, at least an even chance in terms of ownership opportunities, or in some cases more um, of a chance at ownership opportunities. Uh, but equity needs to be a larger conversation. Those communities that um, have really dealt with uh, the war on drugs also need other types of assistance because their lives, lives have been impacted by more than a single conviction. Uh, and so uh, it is important to, to think about uh, working through those issues. They have been some of the most complicated, some of the most litigated, um, and some of the most challenging issues, particularly in the licensing space that we've seen in state programs. But increasingly states are embracing this, and I think it's an important change in the American conversation. Colorado and Washington early on were not thinking about equity issues in the way that uh, we are thinking about them now, but new states, so for instance, Illinois that just legalized uh, via legislation last June, um, they uh, set up the most robust equity program in the United States. And that's in large part because Illinois has a very diverse population, particularly with the city of Chicago, um, but also because the conversation around this issue has changed so dramatically since Colorado and Washington voted in 2012, that the Illinois legislature um, made the demand to the governor um, that legislation would not be passed with their votes that were necessary until these issues um, were, were resolved. Yeah, it's certainly an important topic. I know you, you mentioned uh, that African Americans were arrested at, at four times the rate of, of white Americans. Um, here in New Zealand, uh, Māori, the indigenous uh, people, uh, are arrested at three times the rate of, of non-Māori. So, so we have a very similar um, problem, certainly. My next, the next question has come in from Andrew. Um, a viewer who's asked about the issue of drug use substitution, uh, which I think is an interesting one. So uh, specifically what he has asked is that one of his university lecturers said that um, accidents, uh, driving accidents had gone down because people were drinking less alcohol. Um, and he was wondering, is there any evidence to back that up? Um, uh, but I'm, I'm interested in that issue of what, what change has legalized cannabis made on other drug use? Because of course, while legalizing a product like cannabis is kind of scary to a lot of people at the idea of you know, legalizing something harmful, it, it has all these other impacts on other harmful substances, which are interesting to think about. And alcohol is, of course, more harmful than cannabis. So what, what's the evidence shown happening there? Yeah, we're not seeing um, really significant changes in the use of other drugs that, that are not really tied to other factors, right? So um, uh, during the period in which we've been legalizing uh, cannabis, uh, we've also seen enormous spikes in opioid use uh, in the United States. Um, that opioid use, of course, is happening um, all across the United States, in states that have legalized and in states that haven't. And in fact, uh, there's some evidence that in states that have legalized, those numbers have, have decreased. Opioid use um, has, has decreased. Now, um, uh, in, in fairness, there's uh, evidence that suggests that it's had no effect. In other places, it's seen increases. Uh, and so, I, I think taken together, what it shows is that there's no real systematic effect um, of cannabis on the use of other drugs. It is true uh, that for some people, they are preferring um, to use cannabis instead of alcohol. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard a lot of that, um, particularly as the, um, uh, as the industry and as the product market becomes a bit more upscale. Um, there can be, and that's definitely happening in the United States, there is um, almost a, a connoisseurship 
around different strains, different methods of consumption for cannabis. Um, and it becomes, um, uh, you know, more associated with sort of high culture at times, um, depending on the way it's used and the, the context in which it's used. And so um, I've, you know, I know people, um, I've heard from people who have, uh, you know, instead of like wine and cheese parties, they will have cannabis and cheese parties. And, and so substitutions are happening uh, certainly at the individual level. I think to say that uh, the decreases in traffic um, uh, accidents and fatalities, which we have pretty good evidence is happening uh, in a lot of states, particularly as the data um, grows longer. Um, uh, I think to say that that's happening because people are substituting cannabis instead of alcohol, the data just don't demonstrate that. And so that might have been a guess from uh, uh, the lecturer that the uh, questioner um, was referring to, but we don't have systematic evidence that, that that's the cause. Um, we've had a question come in from Gavin um, that I think is, I, I want to address because it, it actually raises some of that stuff Eric was talking about before, that there's a lot of misinformation out there about what's actually in our legislation. Um, it also, and it touches on the issue of normalization, which I also think is an um, important one. Um, so I will first, so Gavin's question is that anyone that wants to use POTCH, the what we call cannabis, can already do so as it's freely available. Uh, but its illegality status at least limits its normalization and more importantly, where people smoke. For example, most people smoke in private rather than walking down Queen Street. That's the biggest road here in Auckland. Mm -hmm. um, do we not already have a happy median within society? Um, so what, what I, um, the first thing before I uh, hand over to Eric, uh, but for, for, to John, and I'd be interested what Eric thinks too, um, to talk about this issue of normalization. Um, in terms of smoking in public, um, that is illegal under our legislation. Um, so that would not be allowed if this bill passes. Uh, that would, uh, so you would not get to smoke down Queen Street, at least you wouldn't legally be able to s smoke cannabis on Queen Street, though I have to say I have seen people smoke cannabis on Queen Street under the law as it stands now. Um, so I think that that issue, uh, you're certainly right that people can um, get cannabis if they want it. Um, and so we're talking, of, we're not really debating the should cannabis be available in New Zealand, we're debating the terms on which cannabis is available in New Zealand. And, and so with that, I'd go to John first to talk about this issue of normalization. Um, it, it, do you think cannabis gets normalized once you legalize it? And what does that even mean? Sure. Uh, so, so two parts. First, I think the, um, you know, I, I certainly won't speak uh, to the experience in New Zealand, but um, I will say in the United States, I've heard that argument a lot that, you know, it's readily available. If you want it, you can get it. Um, that's in the United States, an extraordinarily privileged position to take. Um, that is an experience that is certainly true for some people. Um, and it is disastrously untrue for other people. Um, the idea that there is a limited amount of consequences and that something is free to uh, be used if, if you want to. So, I'll give you a few examples. Um, in the US, um, you know, having a drug arrest on your record is something that could be very devastating for you um, when you go to apply for jobs, even something like a minor cannabis infraction. Um, and so uh, for some people, I mean, that's certainly not stopping a lot of college kids from uh, using cannabis or other young, uh, you know, early 20s uh, individuals, but um, those risks are real. And so people, you know, uh, who have started out in the world post-university, uh, they are probably thinking about some of those concerns. I certainly, I live in Washington, D.C. I have a lot of friends who work for the federal government. Um, those are very serious considerations for people. And so the idea that um, that is uh, just, it, it's already just a, a common thing without people really having to think about it doesn't necessarily reflect reality in the United States. Um, in terms of normalization, uh, the questioner is absolutely right. Um, it, this drug is normalized when it is legalized. It is no longer seen as taboo. It is no longer seen uh, with the same sort of stigma that it once did. You see people, um, so for instance, in the United States, the fastest growing demographic group of users of cannabis in legal states are women over the age of 50. Um, why? Uh, because their kids are out of the house, 
Um, they're letting their hair down. Their friends are doing this. They, they probably used it when they were in high school or college and probably haven't used it much since. Um, but they're, they're cannabis curious again. Uh, and uh, part of the reason why they are not accessing, we're not accessing it, was because it was illegal, and because there was a stigma around it. And that stigma is starting to crumble. Um, that's a very positive thing, I think, in a lot of contexts. It can also be a negative thing as well. Um, if it is overly normalized to young people, um, that over-normalization uh, can uh, come with the idea that there are not risks and there are not consequences. And so I think it's important to continue to have an honest conversation about cannabis, like most people do about nicotine or alcohol um, or sex, uh, for that matter. And so uh, I, I think uh, that normalization is the point, um, I, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, but taking normalization too far, like with anything, um, is probably uh, going to present a challenge that, of course, you can regulate against as a society and as a household. Yeah, I, I agree with John. Um, my read on the evidence, look, it, it looks like there is, if anything, some slight declines in youth use with restrictions on access by age. Uh, I'm Canadian rather than American, but I know that my wife says that when she was a kid, it was much harder to get alcohol than it was to get cannabis at her school because there were legal age limits and you get in trouble for selling to a kid and the drug dealer just didn't care about that. Um, so I'm not sure that we need to be quite as concerned about normalization among much older cohorts that are going to be better informed about what's going on and we might expect to be a little bit more sens uh, sensible around taking risk. One of the concerns that we have heard, or at least from, from where I am, uh, from we've got we're a business or, business membership organization, and some business members wonder when you get that kind of a normalization among an older workforce, how do you handle health and safety issues around heavy equipment operation or things like that? It's not like you can have um, if you can tell some when somebody's drunk. It's pretty easy to check on that. You can smell alcohol in their breath. There aren't quite the comparable regimes around cannabis. How have employers been able to deal with that to maintain health and safety? Because that's been one of the concerns. The other sort of branch on this, uh, following on from John's discussion and, and the original question, the status quo does involve like people kind of hiding their consumption and that would continue under the regime as has been suggested here, that it'd be in private homes or in licensed consumption facilities, not in view of the public. Uh, but the gangs get cut out of the, out of the mix that you're getting um, safe supply that you know what, what's in it from a licensed retailer and you're less likely to have it adulterated with other things. One of the concerns that we sometimes hear is that, well, if the gangs are cut out of this, what are they going to turn to instead? Surely crime will go up. From what I've seen on the evidence, crime, if anything, goes down. But I, I would love to hear a bit more from John on how workplaces are handling this and any other observations on crime. Uh, sure. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Uh, the workplace question is a very powerful one uh, in the United States. Businesses are very leery of legalization because they worry uh, that it's going to create this scenario in which um, everyone's coming to work high and there's nothing that the uh, employers can do about it. Um, so uh, two, two sort of responses to that. Uh, one is that you're not seeing huge spikes in people coming into work high. Uh, and for people who do, um, you, would, you would treat them in the same way, as you said, Eric, as someone who came into work drunk um, on legal alcohol. Um, you would fire them, and you would be perfectly in your um, uh, uh, purview to fire them. Uh, in a lot of the ballot initiatives in the U.S., and then in, in other cases and in, in concert, in subsequent legislation um, in those states in the U.S., there are workforce protections in place, and now we have common law. Um, that does the same. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court of Colorado ruled that employers have the power to uh, terminate individuals uh, because of their use of cannabis, because they're testing positive for cannabis uh, in the workplace. Um, that zero tolerance rules are just fine. The Colorado case actually involved um, a paraplegic who only used his uh, recommended medical cannabis at night for uh, spastic muscle issues. Um, he was fired by a pretty large company in the United States, and the Colorado Supreme Court said that termination was um, constitutional and, and legally valid. Um, that it ended up being the ideal case, right? Because if, if you say no to this guy, 
you're gonna say no to every other situation that could possibly pose itself. And so from a legal perspective, it was a perfect case. I think if from a moral perspective, it raises um, different questions. Uh, but that's what's happening. You know, I spoke to someone who works um, out west, in a Western state that um, has legalized cannabis. And, and I don't like to base, um, you know, conclusions on anecdotes, but it was a very interesting anecdote for me. And it was true. He, he works in a, a pretty big company um, that is involved in um, like aerospace and defense contracting. And he said, you know, since legalization happened, it's really hard for me to find someone who hasn't used cannabis in the last two years, meaning among kids who are just getting out of college and, and entering the workforce or, or young professionals switching uh, businesses. He said, that's a real problem. And we've had to make some adjustments accordingly as much as we possibly can. He said, once they're hired, we never have a problem with their cannabis use. It, it, we, we do random testing and it is never a problem. Getting them in, people are going to be compliant. They're not coming to work high. Um, the people who do are certainly going to get fired. Um, and so in that sense, and as you, you described, nothing changes pre-legalization to post-legalization in terms of what a business owner needs to do uh, in terms of dealing with a, a cannabis um, uh, uh, using or cannabis high uh, employee. In terms of uh, violent crime or, or crime in general, yeah, what we're seeing is that um, uh, cannabis legalization is not leading to um, spikes in violent crime that are um, you know, directed to the drug trade or to these businesses. Uh, we are seeing some instances of armed robberies of uh, cannabis facilities. Those are extremely uncommon. Um, they're very rare events. Uh, they do happen. Uh, that happens in large part in the United States because most cannabis businesses are forced to be cash only businesses. So if you're looking to rob a place, um, a bank looks pretty good, but bank vaults are pretty hard to crack and you're not going to get many uh, dollars out of a cashier's drawer, out of a teller's drawer but you know for sure there's a lot of cash moving through that cannabis business. And so um, they become targets that that target is actually created because of broken policy in the United States. Um, but again, even despite that, there are rare events. And I think uh, security requirements at these facilities are a, a part of why those are rare events. Um, but yeah, it's not leading to murders and rapes and uh, the rest of the stuff you hear come out of President Trump's mouth about what's happening in the United States. Um, that's not happening because of Antifa, it's not happening because of a big democratic conspiracy, and it's not happening because of cannabis legalization. Um, we've just had a question come in from Ali Tahiri asking, why legalization instead of decriminalization? Did the United States debate those two options as well, and, and why legalization? The United States definitely uh, debated those topics. In fact, in the 1970s, uh, um, a lot of states decriminalized cannabis, um, starting with Oregon in 1972 or 1974, um, and including a lot of liberal and a lot of conservative states, north, south, west. Um, and uh, so for your viewers who are unfamiliar with the distinction, uh, uh, legalization is an outright legal system um, with some sort of uh, method of supply and then uh, the ability to have some sort of transaction, whether it's a monetary transaction or a gifting transaction um, to, uh, to meet demand. Decriminalization does not remove all uh, legal uh, barriers against cannabis, but in the United States, what it does is it turns a minor crime into the equivalent of a speeding ticket or a traffic ticket. Uh, and so uh, that is certainly a much smaller punishment uh, for uh, you know, possessing cannabis or, or using it um, in the wrong uh, places, but it is still a, a drug offense uh, in the United States. And what we found is in states that have decriminalized, uh, those racial biases uh, do not change. Um, in fact, some places they get worse. Uh, and so uh, police are still able to use the existing law enforcement apparatus to really disproportionately impact certain communities. And so um, decriminalization is uh, simply driving a market into the shadows and making sure that the government is halfway okay with something, uh, but not okay enough to regulate its safety and to regulate whether children are going to get access to it or to regulate uh, the manner in which businesses operate or where they operate. 
they're comfortable with people using it for a small fine um, and also using it from illegal operators who are producing it and selling it. To me, that's just a screwed up system. Um, either keep it illegal because you think it should be illegal or legalize it and regulate it and tax it um, and make it a more responsive. That The decriminalization middle ground, um, just like I said, is the sort of policy upside down for me. It's um, continued costs and very few benefits. Yeah, I just jump in um, there and um, the Absolutely. And I think one of the issues with decriminalisation is because it doesn't address the supply of cannabis at all. Um, at what you buy, you have no idea. It's like you have no idea if you're buying a beer or a vodka, you know, you're just, you're, you're buying a product and you don't know the strength of it. And one of the, the impacts of that is that over the years, uh, the strength of cannabis has trended up. Um, and I, one of the talking points on the no side that I have never really bought into is that, you know, because there are limits on potency in our legislation that the black market will thrive by selling extra extra potent cannabis but uh, my my experience since i've been working on this issue is a lot of people do not want that extremely strong cannabis and would rather be able to avoid it if they could um but obviously at the moment you know that's that's very hard to do um but uh, anyway but we're we're heading towards the end of the webinar now so if you did have a burning question now is the time to to ask um this uh, this uh, question i'll ask next has come in from raywin stone and she's been waiting a while to ask it so so um, apologies, it'll make you think back to some remarks you made early when you were talking about cannabis le being legalized and that there had been some unforeseen consequences that, that regulators were now moving to address. Um, what were you referring to? Um, were they things that our legislation here in New Zealand is addressing uh, already or, or, or what, what did you mean, basically? <laughs> Sure. So there's a, a series of areas in which uh, American states either can do better um, or have found that they needed to do better. Um, one of those areas, as I said, involved social equity and racial justice and making sure that uh, the new cannabis legalization program addresses the harms of the past. Things like record expungement and the way that record expungement is actually carried out. Um, uh, increasing funding to areas that have been uh, harmed the most by the war on drugs and certainly creating opportunities in the cannabis industry uh, for those communities. Uh, there are uh, other areas as well. Uh, in the United States, we have uh, at times fairly complex licensing systems uh, within states uh, and uh, in a shared state federal context um, that has created some of the most dramatic problems uh, within the country. I think this has happened most notably in California, um, but it certainly happened in other places like Colorado and Nevada as well. And that is um, the state puts out regulations um, the, that need to be followed. Uh, and then uh, in some cases, county governments, and then within counties, city governments um, all have their own sets of regulations uh, and all have their own licensing that has to happen. And so in some cases, you would have a business that would say, I have my license from the state of California and I have my license from Los Angeles County, but I don't yet have my license from the city of Los Angeles. And I can't operate until I have all three of those. In the way that um, intergovernment relations um, happen, sometimes can work very well. A lot of times uh, can be, uh, be tension on each other. And as you're rushing to get a system um, up and running, uh, sometimes you don't understand where those friction points are until you have those frictions pop up. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, unintended consequences, especially around licensing. I think that's being very generous um, because a lot of cities and counties and states in the US face massive screw ups when it comes to licensing issues in a lot of industries. And so this didn't just organically arise as a new cannabis specific problem. And so I think states and um, localities could have done a much better job uh, on that. Uh, the other I think too is um, having serious advertising campaigns about the risks of cannabis um, and making sure that they're speaking to the right people in the right context. Um, so public health, public safety, youth use, and especially addiction and dependence issues, um, I think are important for public health and public safety agencies to do. Um, but like I said, to do effectively, I've seen a lot of these public service advertisements in the United States um, around this, and they are, they are like comedy skits. Um, and I think to myself, kids are laughing at this. Adults are laughing at this. You're not doing it right. And so when you see it, um, uh, uh, ads like that, um, it is just a lap, it's a tone deafness about how it's, what's going to work. 
um, or it is just um, people who are really bad at their jobs, I guess. But making sure that those things are right. My last point on addiction and dependence in particular, um, one of the worst myths that I hear from the pro-legalization community is that cannabis is not addicting. Um, cannabis um, use disorder is a real thing. It, it, it affects between one in nine and one in 11 regular users of cannabis. Um, and it is something that uh, any jurisdiction that is serious about legalizing needs to think about building in uh, to their systems. And a lot of states have done that. And a lot of states have done that um, pretty effectively uh, based on tax revenue that comes in. Uh, but in the United States, at least, we have a very serious um, uh, shortfall in funding around mental health and addiction services in every state and nationwide. Uh, and I think when you're taking a step into this arena, thinking these things through and thinking about the way that you can reform uh, your own um, addiction and dependence uh, services to meet what might be new needs uh, based on this is important. But it's important to go into it saying, how can we make this better? Not simply to ignore the reality and other benefits that can come in and manage the risks in an effective way. Yeah, and just giving a plug for New Zealand in that context, some of the best, uh, I would say, research uh, on the long-term implications of cannabis use uh, comes out of two long-term New Zealand uh, studies of groups of New Zealanders over the course of their lives. There's the Dunedin study and the Christchurch study. Um, and um, I should note that the professors that did those studies and that know in great depth what you're talking about, about the rate of cannabis use disorder and the potential impacts on youth mental health. Both of those professors strongly support legalization. And I actually think Professor Joe Bowden might actually be on the webinar today. So um, say hi if you are, Joe. But um, I think that's worth noting. And that if you are interested on, I know there've been a few questions that we may not have got to on this kind of area. If you're interested in the evidence on that, I really suggest looking up the Dunedin cohort study and the Christchurch cohort study and, and look at what they have found about cannabis use and then look at what um, those professors are saying about why they have come to support legalization. Um, uh, we don't have a lot more time, so this will be uh, the last question I'll put to John and then I'll hand over to Eric to make some closing remarks. Um, this question has come in from Helen and other people have asked it in different forms. Basically, there's a lot unknown here. You know, the unknown long-term effects on health of cannabis is what Helen has specifically asked about. We don't know what long-term harm we'll be dealing with. Uh, the research relating to the impacts of long-term use is insufficient. Can you comment on this, please? Um, so I was interested, that, or the, the unknown, can you, can you address that, that aspect? <laughs> uh, so I can promise you I can't address the unknown, um, but I will address the known. Um, and that is, we actually have a lot of pretty good medical research about long-term cannabis use. Um, we know uh, what it can do to things like uh, long, uh, long term memory, short term memory. Um, we know uh, its effects or lack of effects on um, pulmonary systems. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think if you, if you look out there, there is some pretty significant research about um, what uh, cannabis use does and, and why is that? Because we've got a lot of people who have been using cannabis for a pretty long time and it's not, uh, it's not impossible to find them. That's particularly true. Uh, in the US, it's true in places like the Netherlands um, and, and other countries that have had, um, you know, relative to the rest of the world, higher uh, rates of use and um, robust medical communities looking at this. And so um, I, I do think uh, you're right, uh, Helen, that uh, we don't know what the long term effects of uh, cannabis legalization is, um, right? Because we're in, the, er, we're in the earliest days of it. Um, what we can do, though, is think about. Um, whether public policies are successful right now in uh, guarding against the policy outcomes that we want. Um, and I think most, and I know most Americans, for instance, will tell you that what we've been doing for the past 100 years has been an absolute utter failure in terms of public health and public safety and youth use. Uh, and so trying something different um, is certainly a better approach than trying the same thing that's failed for 100 years. Um, and so that's the, uh, that's the situation uh, that we have in the United States. Um, and I think it's important to remember that, like with uh, alcohol, like with nicotine, it's true of cannabis too, um, that a significant percentage of the consumption is done um, by a smaller percentage of the users. Those are the users we need to think about um, in terms of cannabis use disorder and in terms particularly of the long-term effects um, of cannabis um, that we know can happen uh, for some people uh, over the course of their lives and certainly happens for youth. 
uh, and, and how do we manage those um, public health challenges and those individual health challenges in responsible ways um, that can help guide people towards better choices when it comes to substances? Because um, at the end of the day, that's the goal. It's not to um, ensure that everyone uh, in New Zealand or everyone in the United States never uses a single substance. That's an ideal that'll never be achieved. It's about making better choices um, and having better relationships to those substances. I'd also just pop in as a researcher, um, the one real benefit I see to legalization is that research will be a lot easier uh, to do because researching uh, and finding out more information, which we always want more information. I don't think we should ever be satisfied with how much we know about anything, but the, doing that research on a product that is illegal is incredibly difficult. And I know because I wrote our report, um, our report, The Case for Use last year, and there is an enormous amount of thought you have to put in and ethics committees that you want to avoid um, if you're going to research something illegal and if you're going to do interviews with people who are doing things that are illegal or God forbid I was in those groups that were trying to actually test the substance itself because you're looking at a months long process to get ethics approval for that. And um, so if you're, yeah, so I, I would say a major benefit of legalization is that for researchers to get the substance and to access the people that use it, uh, both of those things will get a hell of a lot easier and there'll be a hell of a lot more research as a result. So, so I, I see that personally as a big benefit of um, if we do get a yes vote. Um, but unfortunately, we are nearly out of time today. Uh, thank you all and thank you hugely to John um, for giving thank us you. the time so generously. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'd now like to hand back over to Eric Crampton to make some closing remarks. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks, John. I really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. And I also like the prod to read the second edition of your book. I'd seen the first edition some time ago, and it's been great to go through the updated version. I'd strongly urge anybody here who's interested in learning more about the American experience to get a copy of the book. It's on Kindle. It's pretty cheap on the electronic version, and you don't have to worry about shipping. Um, you'll get to learn a lot. It, it talks also through some of the issues that Kathy just raised about the difficulties in doing research on an illegal substance. There's only one place that's authorized to grow uh, cannabis for research in, in the United States. I picked that up in John's book as well. I'm not a cannabis user and I have no intention of becoming one with legalization. I'm in my mid forties. I've got kids approaching their teens. I'd prefer that they not become cannabis users. There are some harms that come with this, but all, the referendum isn't really about whether you like cannabis or not. It's about how do you set things up so that you don't get the harms that are associated with it? With the regime that we've had, we've had fairly high levels of cannabis use. We're among some of the higher proportions of users internationally. Cannabis is fairly popular here, but it's in a framework that isn't really conducive to reducing harms. It's difficult to tell what you're getting. If you're going to be interacting with the criminal sector, if you're going to be in that market often, those all impose risks. And when you put it into a legal framework, it's easier to put controls in that restrict access for kids, that make it harder for drugs to get, for, for use to get drugs. And that then you get into the whole kind of post-responsibility post framework that makes sure that there's some discretion being applied in the consumption facilities, that things aren't going weird. Um, it's just a safer way of handling something that's a bit risky. Cannabis isn't crazy risky on the whole scale of drugs. It's not cocaine, it's not heroin, uh, but there are real risks there. In my view, the legislation that we have is even more conservative than I would have drafted, even though I'm not intending on using. Um, the, the legislation will have to be weighing that some of the restrictions might still encourage there to be a black market running along the side and they'll be watching for that but the legislation will be reducing harms. It's not as bad as what we've had. And you don't have to like cannabis or to support cannabis to think that legalization within the kind of regulatory framework that has here been suggested is, is a good thing. Um, I expect that the legislation will reduce harms. I think there's a bit of work yet to be done in committee. I would hope that those who are skeptical about legalization and who do have concerns well, at least let it get to the select committee stage because the legalization um, referendum only brings it to the committee stage. It'll then be discussed further. And if there are things that you think that the legislation has gotten wrong, those are things to be submitting on. There are still aspects that have to be debated and discussed, especially around edibles. We don't have a framework on that yet. Uh, there's work that's yet to be done, but none of that can happen if 
New Zealand votes to maintain prohibition. We're going to still be in the same environment that gets all of the harms of cannabis and all of the harms of prohibition without a framework for trying to bring those down. When I used to lecture in economics at Canterbury, I, I had a week on the economics of prohibition and I'd there point out that legalization and tax turns revenue that would have otherwise gone to the gangs into tax revenues that can be used to mitigate harms. And I think that the approach that the government has taken on this is on the more conservative side of it and will achieve some of that objective. So thank you, John, so much for detailing some of the experience in the United States, for showing that some of the scare stories that we have been hearing a lot about here have not come to pass. There look to be some real concerns that we do need to be thinking about, especially around whether workplace relations legislation is adequate to the task that you've just described. We've got a little bit harder here to fire people. We might need some differences, some thinking through how that approach gets handled so that it's fair for workers on the one side, but also um, avoids the harms that, that you could have in some risky environments. And we can do that. I think it's certainly possible. So thank you so much. I strongly urge people to read the legislation, to look at some of the resources that Kathy's put up in the chat channel that give the details on the legislation here and what would actually be allowed and not. So thank you so much for everybody's participation. And thank you, Kathy, for getting all of this together. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, John. And uh, I hope that uh, you have, get, have found some food for thought here. And um, John, I hope you learned a little bit about New Zealand. <laughs> so oh, thank yeah, you for absolutely. That. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Thanks for working, thanks for working with you, uh, uh, Eric.